Morning, APU. How's everyone doing this morning? Woo. How many of you guys are excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Woo. Amen. We are so glad that you guys are here. Um, this week might be a little bit different in terms of worship teams. You might be seeing different faces, different teams, but we just encourage you just to be continuing that posture of worship and as we just continue worshiping God, amen? All right, let's get this started. sing it. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And oh, sing how great, how great is our God. Come on, let's declare this morning, age to age. And age to age. He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. Sing how great 
worship you, Jesus. Jesus, be the center of it all. Jesus, at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus at the center of it all, Jesus at the center of it all, and everything from beginning to the end, it will all be it's always been you Jesus and Jesus nothing else matters oh nothing in this world will do oh nothing but you and Jesus you're the center and Jesus. 
Show me 
Lord, we just thank you so much for your holiness and your goodness, God, and the way that we can build our lives and center our lives around your love that is our firm foundation, God. I pray that as we go into our weeks, um, that you will just be the center, um, that we will remember to focus on you. Um, Whatever is happening, school, friends, relationships, whatever, um, God, nothing else is more important than you, Lord. And so I pray that you will just remind us that you are near to us. Um, as much as we want to center our lives around you, God, you also draw near to us and you call us closer to you, God. So thank you so much for your love. and pray that we will have a great rest of the chapel. Thank you, Lord. We just praise your name. Amen. Holy, there is no one like you. I pray that those songs just continue to minister to you throughout our chapel service as well as throughout your day today. We pray that you can stay in a posture of worship um, as you get to start your week off with chapel. Um, Happy Monday after Super Bowl. Um, I'm here to give a quick announcement as well as introduce our morning speaker. And so many of you um, noticed that our our chapel band setup was a little different this morning. We wanted to have a little more restful increase in um, your worship experience this morning. But here's the thing. When the music is a little bit quieter, we get to hear all of your beautiful voices. And there are many talented and gifted worship leaders and vocalists and instrumentalists who are out here in the crowd. And so this announcement is for you. If that is you and you're feeling that little tug on your heart, getting a little hot, take your phone out, scan the QR code because these applications are closing very soon. So you need to get on this so that you can be up here leading the rest of your student body um, into the presence of the Lord. Amen. Leave it up one for two more seconds. Take your phone out now. Take it out for a good reason. Take a picture of this QR code. Share it with a friend because you heard them singing right next to you and you know they should apply. Amen. Okay, so I have a privilege and honor of introducing our morning speaker who has become a friend of mine and partner in ministry. And so Dr. Courtney Davis is a professor in communication management, and she has been a partner in ministry with Chapel, a dependable speaker that we can lean on and give a powerful word. And she also partners with athletics. Any athletes out here? Yes, I want to give a shout out to softball because I'm a softball player, but I want to give Courtney all the time that she needs. So let's give a warm Monday welcome for Dr. Courtney Davis. Well, good morning. I was in the fourth grade and my mom took me to the eye doctor. And I went to the eye doctor and I was there for the first time and they did all these terrible things to me, like sprayed air in my eye and that was very startling. Um, And then they put this big machine in front of my face and they kept asking, right, with the letters, you guys all know, with the letters that are like, is it better? Is it better? Better or worse? Better or worse? Better or worse? Anyone? And you feel like you're failing an exam. Raise your hand. Thank you. I see you. I see you. Wait, you're going to see where I'm going to go with that. And for the first time in fourth grade, I needed glasses. And I, I'm not going to talk about the social anxiety. I'm more going to tell you that for the first time they put glasses on my eyes, there was a window to my left side, and I looked out the window, and for the first time in my whole nine years of life, I saw leaves. Leaves on trees. Because up until that point, trees were basically like blurry green blobs that stuck on sticks. And all of a sudden, my world was changed. I saw the world clearly. 
So what I want to do today is talk about work, because a lot of us think a lot about work. You're all college students. You would like to be full-time employed. And if you don't want to be full-time employed, your parents do. <laughs> when you leave here, we want to do really good work. Give me a good solid head nod. Okay, I appreciate that. You don't all believe that yet, but I'll get there. But the problem is that we've been duped by the world into believing, I think, two lies. Okay, the first lie is this, that work is supposed to be awesome. It's supposed to be awesome. It's where we live out our spiritual gifts. It's where we have the life-giving work, where everything is amazing. If I just find my purpose and my calling, then I'm going to be set for life. Raise your hand if you've heard that before, some rendition of that. Okay, here's the second one. The second one is that work is this really awful thing to do. It really gets in the way of, well, everything. And we just have to do it. We have to do it because that's what mom and dad want me to do. That's how I need to make a living. And if I want to persist in the world, apparently adulting is very expensive. Raise your hand if you've heard that. So today, I want to talk to you about work. I want to help you better understand why we work, what work we should pursue, and how we should do that work. That my hope is that you actually hold something from chapel this morning and walk into your 1140 class or your 1250 class. You step into a practice room or onto the practice field and you say, you know what? I have good work to do today. Would you turn to someone and say to them, I have good work to do today? You don't all believe it yet, but I'll get there. Okay. Why should we work? Why should we work? That's our first question. Why should we work? The world tells us a whole bunch of things I just told you that work is for. Work is for achievement. It's for identity. It is the where we get our purpose. Most of us, as you step out of here, you meet someone on a plane, and they'll generally say, oh, what's your name? And what do you do? And suddenly, what we do and who we are become very, very close. But that's not why we're supposed to work. Why do we work? Let me reframe it for you. We work because God was the original worker. Let's look at Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there is light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There is evening and morning the first day. All right, first five verses of the Bible. I'm going to give you a rundown of Genesis 1. God creates the world. He speaks the world into motion. He names things. He distinguishes. He creates diversity. He calls all of it good. He brings order out of chaos. He brings beauty for us to look at. That Romans says we should be without excuse when we see God's creation. For the efficiency-minded, I'm so glad he created things for purpose, like their utility, that I can do things with, with what he created. You know how the story goes. God then created man. The word of God says, in the image of God, he created them, man and woman, he created them. Adam was brought into immediate, right relationship with the triune God. Perfect community. And then God gives him work to do. See, God created us and designed us to work. Some of you might remember late in a summer, call it when you were younger, I'm hoping it wasn't last summer, in elementary school, you'd get to like late July, early August, and you would say the words that every parent hates hearing. Mom, I'm bored. I'm bored. I don't know what to do, mom. There's nothing to do. 
That is a deep longing to do the work that God created us to do. We need to do something. And when we see that God created us and designed us to work, that should be a game changer for us. To see work as inherently good. To see your lab report that's due later this week as inherently good. To see the verb conjugation sheet for Spanish 2, to see that is good. Some of you are like, nah, -uh, I'm not there yet. What if work is inherently good? Well, that's a game changer if what we have caught, what people have taught us is that work is actually punishment. It's just something we have to do. And I'm only going to do it because you told me I have to. See, work is not meant to be punishment. It's not meant to be dreaded. It's not something we just have to do. We are made in God's image. God created the heavens and the earth, so we should see work as our Father does, as natural, God-given, and God-blessed activity. And if you're passionate about the gospel, well, then we've got to think rightly about our work. See, if you believe and profess that Christ is Lord, and if the gospel changes everything, then God, the gospel has to change this one thing called work. Jesus came to save us, yes, but in a much fuller sense, Jesus came to redeem all of creation. And our work, yours and mine, is an invitation to participate with God in his redemptive work in this world. Why do we work? Because God worked, he still works, and we have been invited to participate in the work he is doing on this earth in his work of redemption. What work do we pursue? Well, what does the world say? The world says a whole lot of things about the kinds of work we should pursue. The world says we should pursue work that gets us onto stages, hi Rihanna. Okay, gets us onto stages, onto huge platforms. It says we've got to be the absolute best and we put nothing, there is no expense that should be spared to pursue everything. You have to lay it all out on the line. The Christian world has a lot to say about what kinds of work we should pursue. Sometimes the church in its really imperfect way has communicated that we should pursue only the things that are of the church, that we should pursue only the things that are a stay-at-home mom. The Christian world unfortunately says some things that we don't intend that the Bible doesn't say. Can I reframe this one? What work should we pursue? The gospel frees us to pursue many different forms of work. And I want to help you understand what it is that maybe you've caught and to try to reframe that. We don't need to wait for a title or position. Our work is what is right in front of us. One of the things that we get wrong is that those in vocational ministry, those who do things around the church, the local church, the parachurch, is in some ways more holy than those in the marketplace, those who are doing accounting or those who are doing finance, other industries that don't quite have that helping profession kind of way. One of my most vivid memories was when I was living in Santa Barbara. My son Luke, who is nine now, he was one and a half then. And one of my favorite memories in Santa Barbara was of Luke and the trash trucks. We lived on a street where trash trucks came barreling down the street nearly every other day. There were blue trash cans for recycling and brown trash cans for yard waste. There were black trash cans for trash. And across the street, there was a large apartment complex that had one of those big dumpster bins, like the ones I imagine you have in the dorms or in UV. And so trash trucks were coming down the street nearly every other day. Well, any time we heard the trash truck coming down the street, Luke would run to the front door, his little one and a half little feet, one and a half year old little feet. My husband and I, or I would run after him, scoop him up in our arms, open the front door and get to the curb in order to do what? To watch and to wave. 
One day, my husband Matt happened to be able to have a conversation with the trash truck driver and said, how often are you greeted the way that you are by our son Luke? And his answer was astounding. His answer was every other block. Imagine for a moment, a career, a job, a profession that most of us don't aspire to. We think of it as pretty menial work, dirty work for sure. And that maybe just maybe a trash truck driver gets more accolades than nearly any other profession that you could possibly think of. Enjoying the cheers, the waves, the adoration of every kiddo under the age of five, every other block. See, in God's kingdom, as he seeks to redeem the world through the work of our hands and our heads and our hearts, the trash truck driver's job is just as important and God-honoring as the most incredible, charismatic, theologically sound pastor you know. Will you join with me in agreeing that God would say all of this work has value? Let me talk about paid and unpaid. Some of you are implicitly waiting for a paycheck or for someone to hire you to do good work. See, both my PhD holding role as a faculty member and my unpaid work as a wife and as a mom, as a foster parent, as a church volunteer, as a friend, all of them present multiple opportunities for me to glorify God in my work and I don't need to compare them one to another. If I can be really honest with you, some of you will say, well, great, Dr. Davis, you're on a stage teaching at chapel. But what if I told you at 9.30 this morning, when I showed up with both of my boys, Luke and Theo, my now seven-year-old, we pulled up to the curb and my son Luke says, mom, my tummy doesn't feel well. Well, I can't take a child into Felix Event Center who potentially is going to throw up while I'm speaking at chapel. (laughs) Can you imagine this happening to me literally an hour and a half ago? That work to decide what to do with my son, Luke, who by the way is home, don't worry. Um, He's home, I called my husband really quick. I said, Matt, I don't need this right now. I do not need this right now. Can you please come pick up Luke? I don't know. I I joked about this in the green room, is that as parents with a nine-year-old, you're not actually sure whether or not they're actually sick. Like, is he actually sick and he could be fine sitting next to my son Theo, or do I need to take him home? Anyway, all those things. Here's my point. I made some very hard decisions at 9.30 before teaching at chapel. Tell me which of the work is more holy. Dr. Ugly, I see you. See, actually, Dr. Ugly, your, your name's here. I added you. Because Dr. Karen Ugly's over there with her boys, Eli and Boaz. Say hey. My friend Jamie Fahey is here with her kids, Josiah and Malin. And then my number two, who is still well, praise God, is Theo over here. Say hi, Theo. So APU doesn't have the day off, which is why I'm here and why you're here, but our children all have the day off, so we all brought them to work. (laughs) True? Amen. So here's the thing. I have important work to do. Dr. Regley has important things to do. (laughs) Miss Fahey, I was trying to figure out what to call you. Uh, Miss Fahey has important work to do. We all have important work to do in our homes, in our offices, in our classrooms, and we don't have to compare that to one to another. See, if Jesus came to redeem all of creation and God invites all of us to participate with him in his redemptive work, then all work, for-profit, non-profit, vocational ministry, marketplace ministry, paid work, unpaid work, all of it. Raise your hand if that's a sigh of relief for you. I can do a lot of things and glorify God. Last question. Nope, I lied. Professors do that all the time. Pastors do too when they're like, we're closing. No, they're not. Third question, how? How should we do our work? 
The world says do your work as quickly as you can so you can get back to the things you really want to do. Let me try something different. How should we do our work? We should do it diligently, creatively, and sustainably. No matter your major, your intended career field, all of us, the body of Christ, we pursue work together as one, acting on the belief that God actually wants to redeem all of creation. No matter your position or your title, whether you have one or not, be the most diligent and creative people in the world. Because... Because in our work, we get to partner with the diligent creator. And if he is actually working in us, then we can do darn well anything. But do it diligently and do it creatively. Be diligent and creative in your music and your art and your storytelling. I am not qualified to be on this stage any moment before I get to speak. I don't do worship, folks. Be diligent and creative in decision-making, in product innovation, in bodily health, in healing. Be diligent and creative in vocational ministry, in spiritual counseling. See it. The world needs your diligence and the world needs your creativity. Let me suggest to you that the way in which you work and the work that you produce Reflect what or who you worship. When you work diligently and when you demonstrate creativity, you indicate to others that you are in partnership with a diligent creator. As Dorothy Sayers says, work must be good work before it can be God's work. With the Lord, let's pursue excellence. Good work done with thoughtfulness, Bodily strength and the right heart through the Holy Spirit is indeed a righteous sacrifice unto the Lord. To best reflect our diligent creator, let's free ourselves and others to pursue many kinds of work. Diligent, creative work. Let's talk about sustainability. And when I say sustainably, I mean let's talk about rest. The world tells us that rest is a reward. If I can just make it to Friday, I get to enjoy the weekend. We dread Mondays. Some of you feel convicted. We dread Mondays. We acknowledge hump day Wednesday. We celebrate Fridays as if we've arrived to something. But I'm pretty sure that wasn't God's design. Genesis 2. Then the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God worked with diligence and creativity and then he rested perfectly content in the finished work. Yes, God worked six days and then rested on the seventh. But Adam was created on day six, commissioned to do God's work. And then the first full day he sees is day seven, rest. As Jefferson Bethke says, Sabbath was Adam's baseline. His first moment, his first memory. God's rest and celebration and filling of the earth is Adam's very first moment. And only then could he go work properly and live into the vocation God had given him. God's perspective was to work then rest. Adam's perspective was to know rest and then work. We work from rest not to get rest. So rest is not meant to be a reward for the work that's completed, but rest is meant to precede the work. In fact, we might say that rest fuels the work. 
One of the ways that that has manifested in my life is I get to Thursday afternoon, usually in my office in the Rose Garden. You're welcome to stop by any time. Thursday afternoon, I take a look at my calendar for the week to come, the Monday to Friday after. And that tells me what kind of rest I need to pursue this coming weekend. We don't think that well or that intentionally about our rest. But if we start to understand that our rest fuels the work, we'll rest a lot differently and we will work a lot differently. And if there is something that this world needs, it needs to rest a lot differently and work a lot differently. If work and rest are seen through this Genesis lens, then work is good and rest is meant to be enjoyed. And when we enjoy it, we then are recharged by the Lord and we can go back to doing good work. So what does this mean for you today? Offer two things. One, we should see our own work differently but I also want to suggest that we should see others work differently. See, if you've caught this vision for participating with God in his redemptive work, when he is at work in redeeming all of creation and you all get to be a part of it, then you must buy into your education here. Do not fall into the trap of believing that only your action team work, only your D group, only res life, only campus life counts to the glory of God. All of that counts for sure. But your classwork counts too. I think some of you approach your education the way that my boys approached packing a few years ago, we moved homes a few years ago and my sons, Luke and Theo, were then four and two. Luke, being four, offered to help. And he, so he said, mom, can I help you pack boxes? And I was like, sure. So I gave him a box, I gave Theo a box too. I said, put in there whatever you think you're going to need in the new house. About 20 minutes later, he brought his box back to me, half full. What was in it? Three train tracks, two trains, uh, four cars, a book, a bouncy ball, and a stuffed zebra. No clothes, no bath soap, no bed sheets. I think you're starting to get the point. In his short-sightedness, he decided what he thought he would need and didn't even fill the box to the brim. Some of you know where I'm going with this. I'm pretty sure there are at least a few of you who are approaching your education that way. You love Jesus, but you don't see the value in this particular class, so you write it off, skip it, or barely skate by. You decide that this particular assignment is busy work, so you give it half the attention it deserves. You read the textbook or the journal article only for the exam. Here's my question for you. Can you be faithful in the little things? Can you read that article or textbook chapter believing that in and of itself, that is good work? If your work is an extension of God's work, then even the one page reflection papers, the mundane textbook readings, all of those are opportunities for you to glorify God in your work. Don't fall into the trap of short-sightedness. In God's sovereignty, he will use all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Don't miss out on the equipping that is possible this semester. See your work differently. But understanding this theology of work also means that we see other people's work differently as well. I hope that I've encouraged you to see your work and to pursue it diligently, creatively, sustainably. But it's also a call to see others work differently. Can you imagine that work actually brings us into relationship with people that we wouldn't necessarily have chosen? There are so many people who are part of your work today. Those of you who went to Shalom before chapel, There's a barista there who is making your work possible today. 
some of you in the campus store, you went and bought your books and there were either Amazon delivery people or people in the campus store that are making your education possible today. A few weeks ago, we went uh, skiing. I took my boys skiing for the first time ever and they got fitted for skis. And we go into the rental shop and they get fitted for skis. I own my own snowboard. I still snowboard, that's awesome. I also have both my legs still working, so it was successful, <laughs> okay? We went to the rental shop and my boys got fitted for skis. They had never skied before in their life. They got fitted, they had a conversation with these folks, Hannah and Carlos. When my boys do a full day of ski school, they learn how to ski and they are bombing down the hill, like bombing down the hill, taking on uh, intermediate blues and they took on a black diamond, not so successfully. At the end of day two, we went back to the rental shop and I said to my boys, because I understand this and this is what I want you to hear, is that I get to go thank Hannah and Carlos for being a part of our family vacation. They made that possible. And the more that we start to see that other people's work make our work and our play possible, the more that you get to partner with God in edifying the body. Those are gospel opportunities. Those are ways in which we get to say, with Jesus, together, we get to restore humanity. Hannah said to me, I've worked here three years and never once have I ever talked to a family after they rented the skis. What if we went back and said, thank you? What if we went back and helped them understand that you are a part of what it is that I do? Tell a group member that their efforts matter, even if they're not perfect. Appreciate the creativity in latte art. Let me give a shout out to media production, Joel and Chris and Noah and Alexia and Hannah. Those are the folks that I went backstage because they had to run my slides and did audio. I'm not here apart from their work. I'm not here apart from the camera people or Chad or his whole team. When we start to not elevate the people who are on the stage, but everybody who makes this happen, we get to glorify God. It's 1120 and I'm a professor and you don't hold students late, so let me pray. God, you are who you say you are and you have given us good work to do. I pray as your word says in 1 Thessalonians 4, that you would help us all to make it your ambition, make it our ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind our own business and to work with our hands, just as Paul reminded us that we might win the respect of outsiders and not be dependent on anybody but God. We love you, Lord. Send these students out to do the good work you've called them to do. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.